All right, so all right, so really the objectives of this talk. So please, at any point, if you want to stop me, please go right ahead. If you have any questions, just let me know, okay? Um, so we're just gonna go over the spectrum of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We'll talk a little bit about the burden of disease and specifically risk factors, and then spend most of our time about how to, how do we evaluate a patient for suspected NAFLD risk stratifications. I won't spend a lot of time on all the cool new therapies that are being investigated, but kind of highlight some of the things that we know we have and some things um, that we already have existing um, in our pharmacies uh, for other medical comorbidities uh, that could potentially benefit people with NAFLD. So I thought I'd start off with some cases and it'd be great if it could be interactive, if anyone's, you know, tells me what they think. Um, so 42 year old Hispanic male with instill finding of hepatic steatosis and ultrasound being performed for abdominal pain. You can see here that the liver enzymes show an ALT of 62, an ASD of 75, an alcohol of 98, a bilirubin of eight, platelets are 200,000 and albumin of 3.8. You can see from these other blood tests, the um, hemoglobin A1C is 5.7%. So that would be consistent with prediabetes an elevated LDL high triglycerides. So we do see high triglycerides in people with um, NAFLD um, and typically associated uh, with metabolic syndrome. So we usually see a low HDL. Past medical history, uh, so consistent with class one obesity and hypertension, averages seven beers a week, no IV drug use, and meds are hydrochlorothiazide, aspirin, no over-the-counter medicines, and no herbal supplements. So First question is, does this person have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis? Yes or no? If you guys want to post in the chat or if anyone wants to unmute themselves and answer this one. I think no. No? Okay. Anyone say yes? Okay. So majority say no. Um, why no? Any thoughts? I think NASH has to have a di I mean, histological diagnosis of inflammation. Okay, no, that's, 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 that's the right answer. That's, that's great. Um, okay, so let's move on to the second part. So what are your recommendations? Assess the patient for liver fibrosis and will need follow-up in liver clinic. Um, assess them for liver fibrosis and you think they'll need follow-up in primary care. Bariatric surgery, D, liver biopsy, or start the patient with vitamin E. Any thoughts? Um, so in the chat, um, Frida saying A, um, Eric said B, um, Rohit is saying A. So kind of A and B seem to be the top ones. Okay, but, but it sounds like we A. don't know how to differentiate who will need what, right? Okay, and then what are your additional recommendations? Do we start them on metformin? Do we counsel them on weight loss of 7 to 10%? Do we start them on a statin or all of the above? Any thoughts? Is that B's again? Fatma says B and Eric says B. Yeah, some B's, one D, but mostly okay. B's. Okay. All right. So next case. Uh, so just just kind of remember what you guys thought about. Um, so a little bit different case. I'm giving you a little bit more information in terms of fibrosis assessment. So 56-year-old female with diabetes, hypertension, hypertriglyceridemia, depression, who's being evaluated for elevated liver tests. She has a fiber scan, which is consistent, uh, which is 7.2, and a Fib4, and a Fib4 of 2.01. An ultrasound shows a normal appearing liver, echogenic, and normal spleen size. The BMI is 34 with a waist circumference of 101. And here are the following medications, metformin, Lipitor, lisinopril, and Zoloft. So the first question is, what is the next step to assess her disease severity? So A, since this is a little bit trickier, non-invasive tests indicate that she has advanced fibrosis, so she doesn't need any further workup. B, the fiber sense indicates stage one fibrosis, so no further workup is necessary. C, liver biopsy as an uninvasive tests are inconclusive, or D, no further follow-up is needed um, as tests indicate NASH and advanced fibrosis. Any thoughts? 
So I think this one might be a tough one and um, because no okay. one needs to be hedging a guess. Okay, that's fine. But by the end of it, you guys will know that answer. And what are your treatment recommendations? You start them in vitamin E. Uh, do you stop the Lipitor because that's what's probably contributing to the elevated liver test? Do you start them on pioglitazone 10 milligrams or do you start them on a Zepig 0.25 milligram sub Q? No takers. So Fatma says A. Shivan says A. Matthew says C. Okay. All right. All right, so we're going to come back to that. So we'll just start off with a bit of an overview. So in general, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is kind of this um, umbrella term that we use to describe uh, chronic liver disease that where you see the presence of steatosis on imaging or histology. And this has to be in the absence of significant alcohol use, specifically uh, 14 drinks per week in women and 21 drinks uh, per week in men. Um, and this also has to be in the absence of steatogenic medications. Then there's, in general, two spectrums of the disease. Um, and for simplicity's sake, we'll just say uh, the benign form and more aggressive form. So here you have non-alcoholic fatty liver. So this is really the presence of greater than 5% hepatic steatosis. And this has to be in the absence of hepatocellular injury. And we know this, uh, we usually identify this by a specific feature on biopsies called hepatocyte ballooning. And then there's the other form, which is NASH uh, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is basically the presence of hepatic steatosis, but it has to be in the presence of inflammation, hepatocyte injury, and this can be with or without the presence of fibrosis. So when we look at slides, um, histology sites, you see it's typically a macro vesicular steatosis. So here, what you're seeing is big fat droplets within the parenchyma. You don't see any inflammatory cells because this is just, you know, bland hepatic steatosis. Then on this side, in addition to seeing macrocytic, macrocytic um, sorry, macro uh, steatosis, you see inflammation, so inflammatory cells, and you see these ballooned hep hepatocytes. I don't know if you appreciate this one here. You see how the nucleus is pushed over to the side. Um, the speckled appearance is all the organelles that are destroyed. Um, so this is what we may describe as Mallory Dank bodies inside the biopsy. So you kind of need these three features to, um, to characterize someone as NASH. How do we differentiate this? As somebody mentioned earlier, you need a liver biopsy. Um, you'll hear this a lot, or um, especially if you're reviewing any clinical trials or presenting them for your journal clubs, that we talk about something called the NAFLD activity score or the NAS score. And this was a scoring system developed by the NASH CRN, which is basically um, eight to nine um, centers in the United States um, that have a big registry of people with fatty liver disease. Um, you have to basically have these three features um, to have NASH, but specifically you need one in each of uh, each of the categories. And typically a score of four and higher is consistent with NASH. Now, why is it important to make this distinction whether somebody has just fatty liver disease or NASH? Um, and the reason for that is when you're trying to put people in buckets of, am I worried about them or not, or not worried about them? You know, what do they need in terms of follow-up, in terms of progression of disease? So this is a very um, well done study where uh, patients were biopsied at baseline and then and then they had repeat biopsies at year one. And what they looked to, what they what they did in the study was to look at what the natural progression of disease was or what the rate of one stage of progression was. As you can, as you can imagine, the baseline fibrosis score of majority of these patients is usually F0 to F1, smaller percentage with F4 fibrosis. Um, and what we found is, what the study found is that NASH basically accelerates or dub, uh, the rate of fibrosis progression literally doubles in people who have NASH versus NAFLD. So um, in viral hepatitis, we tell people that the natural history of progression is about five to 10 years from one stage of fibrosis to another. But when you are differentiating NAFL and NASH, you can, literally, you can, tell, you can tell people knowing if you have NASH is important because your risk of progression from one stage to another is seven years, while if you didn't have NASH, it'd be 14 years. Then also, um, so risk of progression, the big things are, you know, increased BMI, age, and having the presence of type 2 diabetes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. 
Also, where you start off in terms of fibrosis stage matters because the um, you know, we, we all have clinical scenarios where we see patients who may have F3 fibrosis today, and then in a year or two have cirrhosis, um, which, which kind of deviates from the timeline that I just gave you, which is about seven years. Um, so this is data, actually, this is to show data from a uh, phase, two phase three studies um, that uh, were uh, discontinued um, early because it didn't meet their um, primary endpoint. But the nice thing about this study is we, they had, the, the authors had, uh, the investigators had access to data in terms of histology at year one at baseline and at 48 weeks, which was the end of enrollment. And what they found is that about 25, 28% of patients will, with stage three fibrosis, will progress to stage four fibrosis, which is cirrhosis in, in as quickly as two and a half years. And the one risk factor that was found to be associated with this was the presence of hypertension. So all F3 fibrotics will not progress at the same rate. And there are some, you know, one in four people who will actually have an accelerated fibrosis progression. So just switching a little bit to epidemiology and burden of disease. Um, in general, the numbers that you may come across are that about one in four adults worldwide have NAFLD uh, with a worldwide prevalence estimated to be as high as 25 to uh, 25 to 30%. And similarly in the United States, the NAFLD prevalence is about 30%. So we're talking about 110 million people. I truly think that this is probably an underestimate um, because of the way we screen for NAFLD um, and also just the bias in the patient population that we look at. So when you look at the map, the world map, you can see that the highest prevalence of NAFLD is in the Middle East and South America. And you can see here North America, you know, right, right behind them at 24% in Europe with the lowest risk, of course, in Africa. Um, but this has become one of the leading causes of uh, chronic liver disease, both in the Western world in both the adult and pediatric population. Um, Another important uh, factor to know is that NASH is the fastest growing indication for liver transplantation. So this is data from our SRTR database. So if you aren't familiar with that, so sorry, this is our UNOS database. It was in 2002 where we started to include NASH as an indication for transplantation in our UNOS database. Prior to that, things were pretty much coded as cryptogenic cirrhosis or unknown etiology. And you can see here, um, when you look at the risk um, with the proportion of patients um, who are listed for transplant, excluding those with HCC, you can see um, NAFLD is, is, is on the rise. Then what they did is they wanted to compare um, the rate of progression compared to baseline, which was 2002. And you can see that there truly is an exponential rise in the number of cases of liver transplantation due to um, non-HCC liver transplantation cases due to, uh, due to NASH. Other really interesting factors that were pointed out um, in the study is that um, it is a leading indication for women with HCC with rates as high as 34%. Um, the majority of these patient populations are typically 50 years and older. Um, a good percentage of these patients have Medicare, but 41%. Um, and again, like I said, uh, both um, fast growing indication uh, for, eight, uh, for liver transplantation. I'm going to show you how it's also one of the leading causes of transplantation for HCC as well. Um, so again, this is a very similar study, but this is looking at the SRTR database. Again, if you are if you see here again, we're using a baseline as 2002. Um, and you can see in, in relationship to 2002, over the 14, 15 years, um, there's an 11-fold increase in the prevalence of HCC from, it, from this 15-year uh, 15 15 uh, cohort. So risk factors for NAFLD, um, the two big risk factors, um, phenotypic risk factors are having obesity or type 2 diabetes. Um, but there are also lots of other risk factors that have been identified, such as individual features of metabolic syndrome, dyslipidemia, specifically trigly triglycerides. Um, 
more and more evidence to support the role of polycystic ovarian syndrome and increasing the risk of NAFLD. So one of our fellows, um, actually a couple of our fellows have um, recently conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at the um, association and risk factors of polycystic ovarian syndrome and NAFLD. Um, so that, you know, that's something that we've looked at here as well. Um, we have, uh, we also have another fellow um, in our in our division who um, is looking at the association of obstructive sleep apnea and NAFLD um, and conducted proactive screening for um, sleep apnea. So more, more to come over the next few months from what she finds. Um, and then other things such as hypogonadism, this is more to do with more uh, pituitary axis um, um, defects and hypothyroidism and then male gender. Um, just highlight about the Hispanic ethnicity. Um, I'm not gonna be going into any genetic risk factors uh, today. That could be for another time, but there have been specific gene, gene associations um, that seem to be more prevalent in the Hispanic population, which increase not just your um, risk of NAFLD, but NASH, um, advanced fibrosis, HCC um, as well. And that's really in the Hispanic population. Um, so while you remember the prevalence rates of NAFLD in the general population, um, what 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 what, I, what this this illustration on the right is describing is the association, the prevalence rates of NAFLD in the type two diabetic population. So this was actually a systematic review and a meta-analysis that was performed a couple of years ago, which looked at the global prevalence of NAFLD amongst type two diabetics. And it's really projected or estimated to be as high as 55%, um, which is, as you can imagine, which is literally double fold, double what we find um, in the general population. Um, here, what I'm showing is really the prevalence of NAFLD um, really mirrors the obesity epidemic that we are in currently. Um, as we have higher rates of obesity, the more NAFLD we will be seeing. And then in the general population, we typically say that the prevalence of NASH is about eight to 10%. And, and when you look at type two diabetics specifically, the prevalence can be as high as 40%. And what we found, what they found in this study was that relatives of, and they had NAFL, they had non nafld controls, relatives of non nafld controls have a very low prevalence of having advanced fibrosis. But even having NAFLD without advanced fibrosis increases your prevalence of having advanced fibrosis, definitely more than the general population. But look at this bar graph here. Relatives of patients with NAFLD cirrhosis have almost a 20% um, prevalence of advanced fibrosis. And there, of course, could be multiple factors. But one, some things to think about is, you know, is there a genetic uh, permeability or susceptibility, but also if you just think about it in a very altruistic fashion, um, you children are a reflection of their parents and a lot of what children eat or young adults eat is what their parents pretty much feed them. So there's probably an element of environmental factors here as well um, as genetic factors that, um, that, that explains this higher prevalence in these uh, patients with NAFLD, whether they have advanced fibrosis or not. So I think this is the, the part that might be of most interest to you guys. Um, so how do we evaluate people for NAFLD and what diagnostic tools do you have um, at your fingertips even today uh, before you send them off to liver clinic? So they, uh, we have multiple guidelines uh, specifically for your benefit, the ACG evaluation for abnormal liver tests. So now, you know, about four years old, um, NAFLD, should, NAFLD should basically be in your differential for elevated liver enzymes. Very important that you take a real good history of alcohol, a review of their medications. And I've listed some typical um, steatogenic medications here. Um, you should be screening for viral hepatitis. Um, so hepatitis A, B, and C. And the big caveat here is, um, I think it just came off that if they're not, if they're not immune to B, A and B, you should immunize them. Um, you should screen them for autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, specific, the specific autoimmune markers is anti-smooth muscle antibody with um, an elevated IgG. Hereditary hemochromatosis, the initial test is an iron panel, so ferritin and iron saturation. For Wilson's disease, because it can look like steatosis, 
on imaging and histology, so seroplasmin levels and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency as well, and then some form of imaging and some blood tests that we'll go into. Things to remember is that unlike other liver diseases with NAFLD, up to 50% of patients can have normal liver tests. And then if anyone is in front of EPIC, if you look at anyone's EMR, you'll see that the what, what is defined as a normal ALT is up to 42, but an upper limit of ALT is actually just 30 in men and 20 in females. So it's very easy for us to... Um, look at just arrows and things that are in bold or or in red but to actually look at the number so a lot of people will be referred to me who've probably had you know one to two times elevated liver tests but their emrs have never indicated that they were elevated so just remember 30 and 20. what we do know is that if you do have presence of elevated liver tests you probably have um NASH, some some form of inflammatory component um in there the second, um, the second, uh, you know, group of people that you want to think about screening for NAFLD are uh, fatty liver and imaging. We do a ton of imaging these days. I was going to say versus physical exam on people. Um, so having an incidental finding of hepatic steatosis should trigger you to work them up for NAFLD as well. Um, and then the other patient population uh, specific for, uh, for me, a particular interest is patients with type 2 diabetes. So we have multiple society guidelines that definitely recognize that this is a high risk population, but the only guideline that actually commits to proactively screening for this population is actually the American Diabetes Association, where they say patients with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes and elevated liver tests or fatty liver and ultrasound. So the two things we already talked about should be evaluated for the presence of national liver fibrosis. Interestingly, the ASLD guidelines, which is the, uh, the North American guidelines and then the European guidelines, we don't really commit to what we should do uh, versus just saying something like, "Let's you should restratify them. So when I think of diagnosis and I think of, is there something in the chat? Um, so Fatma has said, when you say abnormal LFTs, um, do you mean just above the upper limit? Well, I, I guess what I meant by that is that NAFLD goes many times unrecognized is because people are just looking at uh, EMR and a liver enzyme. So if you look at EPIC, 40 is not considered elevated. Does that make sense, Fatma? So what I'm trying to say is that instead of just looking at EPIC and looking for things that are bolded or things that are in red or have an arrow sign, you know, saying it's abnormal, actually look at the number. And if it's greater than 30 in men, in, in men and greater than 20 in women, that in your mind should trigger that this is not a normal liver test and I need to investigate it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so then the next question you kind of want to ask yourself sorry about that is, you know, again, do they have NAFL or do they have NASH? And then the next one is, you know, do they have fibrosis and how much fibrosis do we have? As a hepatologist, this is the population I care about, the people who have F2 fibrosis and with, uh, with NASH. I mean, I care about the whole population, but these are the people that really benefit from coming into a liver clinic. Majority of these patients who will sit in this category can probably be taken care of in primary care clinic or other subspecialty clinics. So disease severity, kind of think of it in threefold. You want to determine how much steatosis do they have, how much NASH do they have, and how much fibrosis is, do they have. And for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to talk a little bit about fibrosis um, and tools that you guys have uh, that you can use. So just to kind of highlight um, the spectrum of fibrosis in people who can have, um, you know, different um, F0 to F4 fibrosis. When we talk about F1 fibrosis, this is the sinusoid right here. Uh, we're just talking about fibrous, you know, fibrous tissue um, within the sinusoid. When we then have sinusoidal uh, fibrosis, which then now uh, kind of spills over into the periphery to the periportal area. So near the portal triads, that's F2 fibrosis. And then when you have fibrous bands that connect one portal triad to another portal triad, that's bridging fibrosis or what we describe as F3 fibrosis. And then these uh, macronodular, so big fibrous bands around liver parenchyma, you see the steatosis in the middle. Um, this is what we describe as cirrhosis. 
Now, the reason we're going to focus on fibrosis is because fibrosis is what matters, at least matters most of the time. And it's because the degree of fibrosis has been associated with both all-cause and liver-related mortality. Uh, you may have seen similar, a similar study or similar slides um, illustrating this. So these are results from a meta-analysis of five cohort studies. And what I want to highlight to you here is kind of two things, um, actually three things. So leading causes of mortality in fatty liver disease are actually cardiovascular disease, non-hepatic malignancies, and then liver disease. And this, of course, uh, makes sense as you have more advanced fibrosis, you will be more susceptible to liver disease. But the interesting thing here is that when you have someone who has NAFLD, even if they don't have any fibrosis, they are still at a higher risk than the general population from, from a mortality standpoint. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that if somebody just has NAFLD with no fibrosis, don't diminish it. I think it's important to say like, it's great that you don't have fibrosis, but hey, you are still at risk for other things, cardiovascular disease, and you know associated complications. So I think that's really important for us to communicate to our patients. And then the other thing to highlight really here is on this graph is that as you can imagine, the more advanced fibrosis you have, as you can see here, there's a pretty um, exponential rise in the mortality rate, uh, liver-related mortality rate. And this is again with more, ex with more advanced fibrosis. Um, so there's several non-invasive tools that we can use. Uh, the FIB4 NAFLD fibrosis score, which you may have heard of, the Apritest BARD score, and there's a whole bunch more. I was going to focus on these two, but I think I'm just going to focus on FIB4 just because of some things that we are doing and we're hoping we can um, institute, uh, but also um, have people in primary care do more often. Um, so the FIB4 as you can see, it's a calculation. Um, it's a combination of using the age, the ALT, ASC, and platelet count. And the cutoffs are different from viral hepatitis, but the big things to know here is a FIB4 of less than 1.3. It pretty confident with high with uh, uh, pretty high confidence to rule out advanced fibrosis. And anyone with a greater than 2.67 are likely to have um, advanced, advanced fibrosis. Our non-invasive tools are better at ruling out advanced disease than ruling in advanced disease. One thing that we know um, in terms of how um, the utility of FIB4 and also how powerful FIB4 can be is that when we applied FIB4 to the NHANES database, uh, we found in, in general, and this has been published a few years ago, um, a FIB4 of greater than 2.67 was actually associated with a fourfold um, um, increased liver related mortality. Um, so having that lower threshold of fibrosis um, and, and, and doing something about it makes a difference compared to what our viral hepatitis cutoff is, which is 3.25. So this is what I want you guys to just be aware of, that this is uh, present in EPIC. We've created this in our EPIC system. And I actually took some snapshots to show you what it looks like. So when you have someone that you're suspicious for NAFLD, you can use this dot phrase, which now has been implemented throughout our Sinai system. You guys should try it out. Um, so it's basically FIB4 score. And it will basically spit out what the number, what the score is. But with it, I have included an interpretation uh, with some general guidelines as to what you should do. Um, so here, greater than 2.67, we recommend hepatology needs further evaluation and liver cancer screening. Similarly, less than 1.3, what do you do? And then, um, actually, I'm going to skip this for a second and just, oh, no, okay. Um, so just letting you know, this is what that kind of looks like. Um, you're all aware of fiber scan, so we have this in multiple clinics. So are you guys at St. Luke's right now, or I'm sorry, are you at Morningside now or West? Uh, both. Oh, both. So I don't know if you know this, but we have fiber scans at both sites. Did you know that? I definitely didn't know that. Yeah, so we have a liver clinic that we have at Luke's at Morningside on Mondays all day with a fiber scan. And we actually have a clinic there on Wednesdays at West as well with a fiber scan. So just FYI. Again, a great point of care testing to assess for liver fibrosis. Um, for time purposes sake, we can talk a little bit about, the, I'll just talk about this very quickly, but the big thing here is you wanna tell patients who are being referred for fiber scans that they need to be at least three hours fasting um, as it can give you high, high false positive rates in people who've just eaten. 
um, and especially um, if they have evidence of acute hepatitis. The neat thing about the fiber scan is we can also quantify the amount of fat in the liver, and this is uh, determined by something called the CAP score. A CAP score greater than 240 is consistent with someone having 0 to 33% fat in their liver, moderate steatosis 33 to 66%, and then severe steatosis being equivalent to 66% and higher. This is an MRI. These are images of an MRI um, PDFF and an MR elastography. Very cool technology and probably the best um, imaging-based tool that we have to detect advanced fibrosis. Um, and here what you're seeing is a pretty normal liver here. And as we get more fibrosis, um, you can see we kind of lose the blues and purples and become more green and yellow and then red with more fibrosis. Um, this is available here um, in our healthcare system. Um, currently, the only platform that does it is the one at MSH, but you are able to order it from anywhere within the healthcare system to have scheduled. Again, an MRE uh, stiffness of greater than 3.67, so different from cutoffs of a fiber scan, has a pretty high sensitivity of 86% and a specificity of 91%. So, Important things for you guys. So when you're thinking of NAFLD, who do you think about this in? People with steatosis and imaging and or abnormal liver tests or elevated ALT or ASD with metabolic risk factors. And I think anyone who has type 2 diabetes on, it, on their own. What should you do? You should calculate a FIB4. We've made it pretty easy. We've created a DOF phrase and then it's going to spit out recommendations for you. And then based on recommendations, you kind of know what to do with them. The big one is when you have an intermediate stage of fibrosis, which is 1.3, you know they need to go for a fiber scan referral. And I'm going to show you how we've developed that as well to streamline it within the system. Um, and then we can decide if they need to be seen by hepatology. So once you've determined that somebody needs a fiber scan referral, this is what the order looks like, referral for fiber scan. And then this kind of page opens up. You just have to fill out one or two things. But the neat thing is we developed the order set where it can actually tell you all the locations where fiber scans are available. So based on your patient preference or zip code, you can pretty much pick where you want them to go. Okay, and it also uh, makes available to you the days that you know the clinic is open, like Wednesday afternoon, Monday mornings, uh, for instance. Um, questions? Nothing? Okay, so treatment algorithm, you wanna just kind of think about three general groups, people who have hepatic steatosis or NASH who don't have advanced fibrosis, that patient population can probably be managed by primary care. Important things for you guys to be aware of is that if they're not vaccinated for ANB, you should vaccinate them and think about referring, uh, doing serial uh, testing for fibrosis assessment. Having significant fibrosis with NASH, definitely think about sending them to us. You should send them to us. Um, we can consider them for clinical trials. And we, again, vaccination is important. And of course, if you have NASH cirrhosis, the one additional thing you want to think about is HCC screening. Um, in general, I think the best way to manage this patient population is a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and these are just some of the specialties that I think um, these patients should uh, see. Very important things that we need to address at every clinic visit is alcohol intake, smoking. If they have other liver diseases, we should treat them. Statins where appropriate. And at each, each um, clinic visit, addressing lifestyle goals, um, whether it be weight loss or some form of fitness. In terms of treatment guidelines for NAFLD, this is what the ASLD and EASL state. Lifestyle modification consisting of diet, exercise, and weight loss have been advocated to treat these patients. And then EASL goes a step further in saying structured programs may be helpful. Um, in general, lifestyle changes, treat core morbidities. I think there's a role for anti-obesity medications. Consider bariatric surgery when clinically appropriate. Um, and at present, no FDA-approved therapies. So the two that are highlighted in our um, guidelines are vitamin E and pioglitazone. So I'm just gonna share some of the literature on that with you because it's surprising how many people come to us on vitamin E without having a biopsy that we have to stop. Um, so I just wanna show you some of that data. 
This is the first study that was actually performed in NAFLD, so literally over 10 years ago, um, which is the PIVIN study where patients were histologically proven by a histologically proven NASH with no diabetes or cirrhosis were randomized to three arms, placebo arm, pioglitazone, or vitamin E. And you can see here at the end of the study, which was a one-year study, there was uh, an improvement in steatosis. There was some improvement in hepatocellular ballooning, but there was no improvement in fibrosis with either one vitamin E or pioglitazone. Fast forward to now 2021, now we have these patients for many, many years. And even now we only see steatosis and maybe hepatocellular ballooning improvement, but there's no fibrosis uh, regression. So it's really important to let patients know like, while we can use these medications, just know that it's not going to really impact fibrosis progression. Um, we do have some long-term data that uh, probably has a better signal than vitamin E uh, for what it does in terms of uh, NASH resolution. And when you compare pioglitazone to uh, placebo, you see there was a significant uh, difference between uh, pioglitazone and placebo for resolution of NASH. In addition, a two-point reduction in the NASH score, but again, there was no fibrosis improvement. So if I were to pick one pioglitazone over vitamin E, I would, I, I would pick pioglitazone over vitamin E if I was going to use one of these medicines. Um, there is some literature on real world experience um, suggesting or showing a signal, a possible signal for transplant free survival and hepatic decompensation with the utility of vitamin E. What you can see here is uh, controls versus vitamin E. You can see there's an increased percentage of uh, transplant free survival. But like I said, nearing statistical significance, even for an improvement in hepatic decompensation. So again, more, more to come, uh, but at this point, nothing, nothing, nothing concrete. Big things with vitamin E is um, understand that it's only in people who have histological NASH. Um, there's no data for diabetics, cirrhotics, or post-liver transplantation patients. Important things to think about is prostate cancer and increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So start off at a low dose in the patient population. With pioglitazone, I think it's very underutilized, especially in primary care. Um, you can always start them off at a low dose and just see how they do. I know patients have a big concern and clinicians about body weight, but we've looked at, the, there's data that looks at the long-term impact of pioglitazone and body weight. And when you counsel these patients, you can tell them about five, six pounds could be, you know, blamed on the pioglitazone, but, you know, 10, 20 pound weight gain is not because of pioglitazone. There's lots of pharmacological targets at present that are being investigated, and a couple of these targets are actually um, as clinical trials here at, um, at Mount Sinai. We have two sites that run majority of our trials. So these are just some of the molecular targets. The way I like to think about it is I think about NASH in a three-pronged fashion. I think about the metabolically active patient. I think about the insulin-resistant type of patient, and then I think about antifibrotics. So when I I'm trying to find the right clinical trial for a patient. I try to figure out first, is someone more metabolically active than they are fibrotic and would they benefit from that drug? Um, I'm just gonna, there's a lot of targets. There's over, there are over, um, there are over a hundred and I think 67 current tr clinical trials going on in fatty liver disease uh, when, when I looked last. The one trial that I just want to highlight, this is phase two study, which looked at the impact of semaglutide on steatohepatitis. And again, um, this was stage two, uh, this is phase two. So uh, really two different doses were being looked at. Again, biopsy proven people with NASH who had anywhere between stage one, stage two, and stage three fibrosis. These patients had to have a BMI of greater than 25 and had to have somewhat controlled, I guess, diabetes. Primary end Points, and these are really dictated by um, FDA. FDA guidance is we want to see resolution of steatohepatitis with no worsening of liver fibrosis. And then as confirmatory, second endpoint was, is there improvement in fibrosis with no worsening of steatohepatitis. These are the promising results. You can see here at both doses are 0 0.2 milligrams and uh, 0 0.4. There was resolution of NASH, uh, significant resolution of NASH compared to placebo at 0 0.12 and 0 0.4. Um, but however, However, there was no um, significant impact on liver fibrosis, and this is probably because 
this was a short study. It was only 48 weeks, which is a year. Um, other things that we found in this study was there was improvement in other metabolic parameters, such as hemoglobin A1C, weight loss, lipid profile, um, and there were no real safety concerns. Um, just to kind of bring it back home, like, you know, what, what are some of the NAFLD things that we're doing um, at Mount Sinai? So we've just started a uh, NASH Center of Excellence, which is a multidisciplinary clinic in NASH. We're going to be doing lots of registry work in biobanking to determine um, genetic, genetic risk factors um, associated with disease progression. Um, a lot of, uh, a few, several medicine residents were involved with me in the screening program for NAFLD in type 2 diabetes, where we use, utilize a fiber scan. Um, um, like I alluded to, we screen for OSA in this population. We have work being done in pregnancy, and we're actually, actually looking right now at genetic risk in Hispanic families. Um, and the other big thing we're trying to do is standardization of NAFLD referral pathways, and I've shown you some of the work that's already been rolled out, which is FIB4 and um, fiber scan referral pathways. And then more recently, um, we completed a diabetes prevention program in this patient population. And more recently, we just had approval of an app um, that will be um, available in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have lots of clinical trials, and this just really highlights a few that we have. I think you guys uh, know Dr. Weisberg is our program director, so he is also very heavily involved in uh, NASH work. Um, so we have several clinical trials, and these are the ones at Mount Sinai, downtown Union Square. And then we have several clinical trials at the um, 102nd Street, which is MSH. And we are hoping soon to have a clinical trial presence even at Mount Sinai West. All right, so now you know the answers to these questions. So our first patient, he was, he's Hispanic. Did I say he? Yeah, he's Hispanic, has elevated liver enzymes, correct? Has prediabetes, has metabolic syndrome, like tri high triglycerides and HDL that's low. He drinks seven beers, so he drinks beer, but I guess not that much. He's class one obesity, and he's on a, a few medicines. So someone had answered this correctly. This person doesn't have NASH because we haven't biopsied this person but he most likely will have NASH because he has so many features of metabolic syndrome and he also has elevated liver tests. Does that make sense? The second question was, what would you do next? So I'm going to say that the best answer would be A here, because if you actually collect, calculated a FIB4 score on this, um, on this patient, it would be 2.43, which would be consistent with advanced fibrosis. So this is someone that we want to see in the liver clinic uh, versus someone who should be in the primary care clinic. Um, they don't meet all the parameters to be referred just to bariatric surgery. I wouldn't liver biopsy this patient at this point. You have to do some form of fibrosis assessment, and you can't really start them on vitamin E because you haven't yet biopsied them. Does that make sense? And in terms of recommendations, we need to do all these things. We need to start the patient on metformin. We have great data on the utility of metformin in the pre-diabetic population through our DPP. So you would start that. We know that um, weight loss goals of seven to 10% have been associated with NASH resolution. So you would be counseling them on that. And you would appropriately start them on a statin because their LDL is high, their HDL is low, and their triglycerides are high as well. So all of the above. The second case, a little bit more complicated. So based on what I shared with you, this is a, you know, maybe an F1 fibrosis, and this is an intermediate fibrosis range, right? It's between 1.3 and 2.67. But this person has multiple risk factors for fatty liver disease, has class 1 obesity, and is already on a bunch of medications. But based on the fact that you have a discordance between your fibrosis scores, um, the next step would be to do a liver biopsy. Does that make sense? So if your non-invasive tests told you that you ruled out advanced fibrosis, then you wouldn't have to do anything further. But you have two tests here that are telling you two very separate things. And you have a clinical suspicion that this person is going to have more accelerated fibrosis based on the fact that they have multiple risk factors, um, um, multiple, you know, multiple risk factors, um, that make you think of um, fatty liver of, of NASH. So the next step would be to do a liver biopsy. And then in terms of recommendations, 
Again, I wouldn't start vitamin E because you don't have histological NASH. You wouldn't stop the Lipitor because we want them to be on Lipitor because it will improve their cardiovascular risk, like I mentioned to you. Um, at this point, I wouldn't start them on pioglitazone. If you look at the diabetes guidelines, the updated ones from last year, after starting instituting metformin, the next thing to do is either use a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT-2, right? And I just presented data to you that ozempic or semaglutide actually has a signal for improving NASH. So this is almost like treating two things at the same time. Not only would you improve their diabetes, you would at the same time probably improve their NASH. I want to say that might be it. 